think you can describe flourishing as a life well lived. It's a sense that you're really happy and joyful in your life. Flourishing is the ability of somebody to uh, fulfill their potential, to have a freedom of choice, to have sufficient resources to live well. To me, human flourishing, it's about how we live sustainably with the rest of nature. Equanimity is flourishing. You feel no resistance, no regrets, no anticipation. Human flourishing is alignment. When your hopes and dreams line up with what you're doing every day. When you're playing music, when you're doing the best you can do, there's a spiritual thing that's in it. I mean, I think of flourishing as the beautiful and full expression of human creativity. What makes me flourish <laughs> is being around dancers. We're all after the same sublimeness. It is the sense that I'm doing things that are productive and useful. The sense that what I am doing is helping other people is a way of measuring flourishing. It refers to the ability of human beings as people to be resilient and flourish even under difficult circumstances. It's how we become the most beautiful and best version of ourselves as individuals and as communities. Philosophy and theology have very rich and long traditions uh, with regard to this topic of what constitutes the good life? What is human well-being? How do we understand it? These were very scientific concepts with very strong prescriptions as to behavior. Flourishing is more than happiness. Flourishing includes having a sense of meaning and purpose. Psychologists, anthropologists, sociologists have taken up the, the themes of human flourishing that were introduced in the philosophical literature. And the result of it is that we have a vast literature. We even have literature that shows that when you study it, if you do the work, you'll actually get happier. How's life on a scale of one to 10? If you say eight, nine, 10, you're flourishing. Just that simple question, how's life? If you say six or seven, you're struggling in some area of your life. Maybe it's lack of sleep, maybe it's stress. If you say five or less, you're suffering and you probably even have a chronic illness. Now this sounds, you know, so vague, but it actually has been tested. So the working definition we've been using at the program for human flourishing is living in a state in which all aspects of a person's life are good. This is a very broad, expansive um, definition. Of course, you know, as with anything in social science, there's incredible cultural nuance about how these things are defined. The Western philosophical and cultural framework is about the individual. And the Eastern wisdom traditions say, that as long as you're thinking only about yourself, you'll never be thriving. Africans are not individual and they're not individualistic in their mind. We're communal. We exist as part of communities and it's what makes us powerful. And, and so what we've tried to do in, in much of our work is to attempt to identify those aspects of flourishing or well-being that seem to be common across traditions. All the research shows that meaning and purpose are critical to human flourishing. Purpose is really more end-directed, um, having pursuits and, and goals, um, life aims that, that one is pursuing. And, and meaning is, is um, 
more cognitive, understanding the context of things, being able to put one's life, um, world events and the universe into a, into a broader context. I think the problem is where we find our meaning, where we find our purpose. Our mind gets it wrong. We assume that a good life involves a rich life and a life of lots of material possessions, a life of accolades. Do people get happy after shopping? Yes, they do, but only for a couple of days. One thing we know from the science is that taking time to make sure you're going after your virtues, particularly the virtues that you hold personally dear, research really shows that that is the way towards a purposeful life. Things like having a love of learning, you know, having empathic support for other people, having a zest for life, spirituality, bravery. Those are the kinds of things that give us a broad sense that what we're doing is really meaningful. Meaningful work is something I've studied for years as an economist and as a social scientist. And it's interesting because I've looked across income categories and education categories and professions and with respect to happiness, there are only two dimensions that matter, service to others and earn success. Earn success is the concept that your values and your and your passions and your skills are coming together around something and, and you can accomplish something great. Service to others, it's not self-explanatory. If you believe that you're serving other people with your work, you believe that you're earning your success with your work, that work will be meaningful and it will be a source of enduring value and happiness in your life. Aristotle used the word character to describe a life well lived, um, a life that's good for you and good for other people. Virtue is sometimes understood as a, a habit, a pattern of um, thinking and, and acting to attain the good. That means our humility, that means our gratitude, our ability to empathize with each other. It also means our imagination and creativity, our curiosity. If you have uh, worthy goals that are not only about you, and if you know how to make other people happy by giving them attention, affection, appreciation and acceptance, then that's the fastest way to be quote unquote happy. When you make somebody happy, you automatically feel happy. I really think of a lifelong process of the cultivation of these character strengths. I think it's a project for a living human being who continually wants to be a better person. When I look at the data as a social scientist, it turns out faith assiduously practiced brings the happiness benefit. To flourish really well as a human being, I need to know and have a relationship with my creator. And that relationship is fundamentally a relationship of grace. Christians use the phrase from the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, uh, enough for each day. Uh, so not hoarding for the future, but being able to be content with that day's gifts. They say that um, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And our spirit is always talking to us. It always tells us, what its beliefs are, what it wants to do, how it wants to interact with the world. It does not translate into a belief in God. His Holiness the Dalai Lama is non-theistic. The Buddhists in general are non-theistic. There are all kinds of practices that don't believe in God the way that I believe in God. But something that will take us to 40,000 feet, that will give us the perspective of the cosmos, whether it's traditionally religious, or more spiritual or simply philosophical, as long as it's really expressed in wisdom and practiced, will give us that benefit. When you compare the you know, very happy people from the not so happy people, happy people are focused more on social connection. Happy people spend more of their time with friends and family members. They prioritize time with friends and family members. They're just physically around other people more often. Friendship is so woefully underrated. We're in a society today that is suffering from an epidemic of loneliness. You find that nearly half of people say that they don't have any close friends at all. 
And there's lots of work where they force people to be more social. They force you on your commuter train to work to like talk to someone else or to like have a meaningful chat with the barista at the coffee shop. And in all these cases, even these kind of weak tie social connections, these brief social interactions, they tend to make us happier. They tend to improve and increase our positive emotions. People often say listening is a key component of happiness. Students are incredibly time famished. And I think a consequence of that is they've sort of lost the art of listening. You know, they've lost the art of plopping down, and really connecting with somebody and listening. Your music teaches you how to listen harder than you play. Because most of the time your, your experience is listening. Listening can unlock the, the, the key to understanding. So it's a humility in listening. It's a humility in genuflection. When I'm listened to, I am actually able to articulate for myself what it is that's deep within. Uh, and the tangle of stuff that's in me is unknotted and unthreaded. So I come to realize more fully what the obstacle to my own flourishing is. And when I listen to somebody else, uh, we can untangle together what would help that person best to flourish in their role. We need to bring listening back as a lost art. I think that kind of connection, a deep sort of listening connection, is really an important aspect of our flourishing that, that that's, becomes harder and harder in the modern age. We find our identity uh, in knowing that we are loved. By love, I mean, of course, something much more than romantic love between two people. Love not as a mere sentiment, love as not as a mere emotion, love as the ultimate truth at the heart of the universe. Love which is a lifelong steady commitment and which then becomes a foundation for the human personality to grow and to flower and in time to flourish. Adversity of all kinds is part of life. I think a flourishing life is not always a uniformly happy life. One recipe for a flourishing life involves coming up with strategies that you can use to navigate negative emotions. Productivity, disappointment, failure, success. So when you flourish, you're able to negotiate uh, the range of experience states. It is only in the most stressful and, 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 and traumatizing times in our lives that we learn the most about ourselves. When we face crucibles, when we understand what we're made of, that's when we learn the most. That's when we are most fully alive. Philosophy and theology is extremely important in reflecting upon what we mean by human flourishing. Where I think science can powerfully contribute, however, is identifying the means to promote flourishing, to, to advance these ends of human well-being. We've been human nature all the time. This is a feature of human nature is that we want to change human nature. And I think that when we get scientific insights, that becomes even easier. We want to move in the direction of flourishing. We need emergence and collective creativity, not simple innovation, which is recycling the past with a little improvement. The brilliance of the entire universe is contained in each one of us. We all have a unique story that nobody else in history has ever lived before or ever will after we're gone. But knowing what to do is really a first step. I'm convinced that studying the science of flourishing can really help us in our own daily lives flourish better.